my name's Lucy, and um, I'm, I'm a sailor and a scientist and an adventurer and a storyteller, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing for the last six months. So it's a project called The New Dawn Traders, and um, it's an adventure trading by sail, sharing stories with um, 10 other people. These were the New Dawn Traders, and we sailed a tall ship um, around the old Atlantic trade routes. And our ambition was to, to create a nice story, to trade food, and to be a positive solution to climate change. So I've been a climate activist probably since I was about eight years old. And, um, and all the climate messaging had been about what you've got to go without and, you know, don't drive your car and, oh, maybe you shouldn't have these foods because they've got a high carbon footprint or they're imported. And we wanted to do something that was about what are the things that we love and how would we still have the things that we love in our lives if we didn't have oil to transport them about? So that was the thinking behind the New Dawn Traders. Um, it wasn't my idea. It was um, uh, this guy, Jamie, the one in the Breton shirt there. Um, and he, he's actually probably known to some people in kind of the Cloud Cookie Land setup. He was one of the directors that set up Coexist in the canteen in Bristol. And uh, five years ago, he came up with the idea with a friend of his um, to sail goods back from a permaculture farm in Brazil um, that he'd been working on. And he wanted to find a way of bringing goods back from this farm Hello, oh, it's back. Um, so he wanted to find a way of getting food back from this farm without using fossil fuels and without uh, transporting them by container ship. And um, this is when him and a friend of his called Alex came up with the idea of a tall ship that would sail around, sail around the world, um, putting on theatrical events and trading food and kind of talking about Hello. linking up food communities around the world. So Jamie's been a food activist for quite a number of years and he's heavily involved in the slow food movement. So that's a bunch of people that are really passionate about food and biodiversity and where, where our food comes from. So that's the thinking behind the New Dawn Traders. And Jamie really quite wondrously managed to persuade um, a guy called Leslie Morris, who's got a very beautiful West Country trading catch. Um, and she's actually moored in Bristol. So if any, all of you Bristol people, if you go down to the quay opposite the harbour side, you can actually see Irene. And so one day him and Alex were walking along um, the, the sidewalk in uh, the harbour in Bristol and they, they went up and asked him and said, how would you feel about sailing to, um, to trade goods um, and at first they said, don't be so ridiculous. That's a really silly idea. Um, you can't afford it either. But then, a few months later, they got back in touch and said, we've actually got an olive oil deal. Would you be interested in filling the return cargo? And, uh, and that's how this voyage came about. Um, I only joined the team right as I was the very last crew member to, to join the project. So there, as I said before, there were 10 of us involved. There's, there's the original nine of us. The owner isn't pictured here, but I've got other pictures of him. And um, I joined the project in January. And um, I quit my job to go on this because I've dreamt ever since I was really small of sailing the world and being a pirate and um, having lots of adventures and seeing the marine creatures and, and just kind of pushing myself to my boundaries. So when the opera came up to be the final person on this voyage, I literally got a text message on the 6th of January going, there's one spot available in this boat if you want it. And I quit my job on the 9th of January and boarded the boat and we set sail on Valentine's Day from Plymouth. Um, so um, our first cargo was some organic ale from Exeter Brewery, which we sailed to Brest and um, we sold it to an organic co cooperative there. And then we sailed from Brest to Vigo where we collected a cargo of fine olive oil. And uh, we then sailed via Tenerife and the Cape Verde Islands to Trinidad, 
and then we sailed back through the Caribbean islands back to the UK. Our original plan had been to go to Brazil because we wanted to go to this permaculture farm, but all sorts of bureaucracy and um, uh, visa issues and uh, problems with the ship meant that we, we didn't have enough time to go to Brazil on this instance, but we, st we still went to the Caribbean and, and we traded our goods there. And um, when we were in the Caribbean, we sailed up the islands and we visited ecological projects and slow food communities and lots of rum distilleries. I got to try an awful lot of rum. Oh, it's such a hard life. <laughs> but, and then we, we sailed home from Bermuda back to Europe. And um, I don't know if any of you were drinking in the Cuckoo Club last night. Anyone in the Cuckoo Club, the cocktail bar? Well, if anybody had a cocktail last night, a rum punch cocktail, then the cocktails were made with the rum that we bought back from Martinique. So it's special transported by sale rum, completely unique. You can't buy that rum in this country. It's a uh, agricole rum, which means it's made from the raw, raw cane real raw cane stalks and it's kind of made on site and it's got um it's got this uh same denomination that you have in france for foods of a specific region so um it's actually quite hard to get so if you drank some of that good on you you've had really great rum um and we got back at the end of june and i've now got some pictures with a slideshow to kind of show you and I'm aware that the weather here is absolutely miserable <laughs> and it might might just be a bit sickening seeing lots of sunny pictures and sunsets but anyway please don't throw tomatoes at me and um yeah do you want to press play so I said before this was our original crew we had a, a shipwright on board and we had a professional sailor, Australian Damon, the Captain Lawrence, a Spanish professional sailor, a paramedic from France, Jamie from Bristol, Antia from Germany, an international development student, and Martina, a seamstress from Leipzig. We had six different nationalities on board, and we had 16 of us in total, but a 10 core. This is Martina, and she's on the sewing machine there repairing sails. And this is us making um, safety nets. Um, we had to do a lot of prep on the boat before we set sail. This is just as we left Plymouth. And that's Jamie on the bowsprit taking amazing photographs. We're sailing along the coast of France. We baked all our own bread on board. So every two days, either me or Jamie would be making bread. And we, we sourced all our food as locally as possible. And we sourced all our dry goods from Essential because we thought it's really important to kind of practice what we preach on the voyage as well. Um, this is sailing along the coast of France and Damon's halfway up the mast doing a repair. This is me just before I had to go and bait the mast. It's called master baiting and you have to cover it in tallow. It's the most grim job I've ever done because it's pig fat, rubbing it on the mast. Anyway, um, this is sunrise on the north coast of Spain. It's very beautiful. Saw lots of lovely wind turbines all along the north coast of Spain. Incredible. They're a bit more progressive there than us. This is Jamie dreaming of being captain one day. And um, we're making homemade burgers. And that's Antia and Ville. Ville's being all dreamy there at sunrise. And this is Damon, the professional crew member. That's, that's me. <laughs> that's Ville. So what was, what was really nice about this voyage was that we were a multinational crew and I thought that was really important because we all got to share stories with each other and everybody had really amazing practical skills which I think are really important for kind of building new communities and, and building new ways of living and we wanted this to be a really kind of not not about nationalities or colonialism but like about bringing you know, different nations together and connecting us by the sea. This is the olive oil um, that we sourced in Vigo. And uh, so it was called Guadalima and it was a single estate olive oil. That's the owner, Leslie Morris, there. And um, all, along, all along the voyage, we had to do lots of repairs or make things because she's a, she's a really old boat and she was recently rebuilt. And this was her first transatlantic crossing after her rebuild, so there were lots of kind of teething problems. 
Um, that's Martina making something called baggy wrinkles, and these are big sort of fluffy balls that go up the shrouds to protect the, the sails from being ripped by the shrouds. And we saw that one of the most incredible things we saw was all the way when we were sailing, we would just see millions of flying fish. I don't know if you've ever seen a flying fish before, but they've got massive wings and they like fly through the waves and they'd like leap on the boat. And we'd end up in the morning finding loads of them all over the deck and then people would eat them for breakfast. Um, we just saw the most incredible skies as well, like sunsets and the, all of them completely different, like just incredible, like the length of time I spent looking at the sky. And um, it's, quite, it's quite strange being on a boat because um, there's 10 of you in quite a small space, but you're in a really vast space and it's kind of quite contradictory. You can feel really kind of hemmed in by everyone, but like kind of blown away by by where you are and realizing you're 2,000 miles away from like any shore and actually if anything happens you've got to sort it out yourself and um, we, as I said we had, um, we had some problems on route we lost our mainsail the top of the gaff snapped when we were sailing from Spain to Tenerife which was absolutely terrifying the entire rig came down and then we had to rig up a kind of makeshift uh, sail which is called a blooper um, that's Leslie regaling us with sea stories, and that, that's a flying fish. Can you see its wings kind of spun out? And this is a photo taken on night watch. Um, one of the things about the voyage is that we had to sail the boat 24/7. We didn't have autopilot, so we we would have somebody would have to be on the wheel at all times, and so we were all in a watch rotor. So there'd be three of us on at a time. So I had to be kind of quite responsible. And this is um, the quarters down below where we eat. And this is learning how to use a sextant, which is um, kind of a manual navigation tool. So you navigate by the stars and by the moon. And, and so the officers taught us a lot about navigation because it was kind of a, a few of us want to do our ocean yacht masters so that we can sail again. So there's quite a lot of learning involved. I think the, oh, oh dear. I think the connection's gone there. Oh. Um, so on the first crossing over, we, we didn't have enough fresh water on board to shower every day, and that was actually one of the hardest things, was the longest time I went without washing was 24 days. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever done that before. It's quite extreme, I think. But we did swim in the sea a lot, and on the way over, we, we stopped three times to swim in the Atlantic. At one point, we swam in 7,000 meters of water which again was one of those things where you're like, swimming in water is just like swimming in water, but then you think about it and you go, oh my God, 7,000 meters, what on earth have I got below me? Ooh. It's quite, yeah, it's like watch out for jellyfish as well. So this is the ship, Irene, and she was actually built in Bridgewater, which isn't very far away from here. And uh, she's a, a classic coastal trading ship. And she was built in 1907 to trade coal and steel and, and stuff up the coast of the West Country. And um, one of the really beautiful things was that every time we left port, we were actually followed by dolphins. Um, dolphins would dance along the bow and they would, they would ride the bow waves underneath the boat, which is absolutely magical. And at one point, we were, we were sailing at night and there's actually most of the, the, on the, on the route out, there was phosphorescence in the water. I don't know, phosphorescence is like when the algae in the water, when they're disturbed, they give off light. And there was so much of this phosphorescent algae in the water that as we were sailing along, we had this massive wake that was lit up behind us. It was incredibly bright and it would be lit up around the waves at the bow. And at one point we had dolphins and phosphorescence and they were like these torpedoes dancing around the boat. It's just completely mind blowing. Unfortunately, you can't do, you can't camera capture that kind of thing. All of us took musical instruments on the, board, on the boat, so um, we occasionally had some jam sessions. They were pretty awful, actually. We, we thought we might form a band, and then we realized we were rubbish. And this is the foxhole. So this, that was my bedroom at the front of the ship. So we all had bunks. Most of it was shared. Made hot cross buns on um, Easter. Caught fish. That's a dolphin fish. Antoine was very proud of catching fish. And that's his tuna. Yeah. 
So um, we had some absolutely incredible fresh fish. Um, we made sashimi with English mustard. Um, so that's kind of like raw slivers of fish with English mustard and it's like totally to die for. So if you're making sushi, you don't need to use wasabi. English mustard's just as good, in my opinion. Um, what else can I say? So that's the back of the boat. Again, more incredible skies everywhere. This is um, arriving into Trinidad, so clambering on the net at the front. Um, all of the jib sails, which are the, the front sails, um, are all attached on this big long bowsprit, this big pole at the front with a net underneath it. And every time we needed to change the sails or reset them, we'd have to go out into that area and, um, and undo them, which was quite terrifying. This is on um, a project called Fonda Monde in Trinidad, um, a really incredible reforestation project. Um, by a, a wonderful woman called Akila Jaramuji, and I, I kind of describe her as Trinidad's answer to Wangari Mathi. She's done so much in Trinidad, reforesting the land and um, teaching people about how to prevent forest fires. And we went and planted some almond trees with her. And we also went to a really beautiful nature reserve as well, where they, they, we just saw hummingbirds in the wild, which is amazing. This is unloading our olive oil in Trinidad. And this is sort of briding customs. Customs were really awful to us this, when we first arrived. They accused us of being new colonialists. And we were like, oh, but we've come here in peace to trade food and to share stories. And they were like, uh, we don't have a category for you in our customs forms. We want to charge you lots of money. And we're like, we don't have lots of money. This is, a, this is an eco project. And they're like, what? And, uh, but the, uh, they came round eventually after speaking to them for about a week and then they said next time you need to write to the president and say you're coming and we're like okay um, these pictures are from this amazing organic cooperative run rum distillery in North Grenada which is actually owned by the workers and they took back the land about 50 years ago and they make this incredible handmade rum this is her enjoying rum in Grenada and um, some birds on the bowsprit um, that's a full moon. I think that's over Union Island, which is part of the Tobago Cays Islands. We did have a fair bit of kind of nice time as well as working time. Um, we got to snorkel on incredible reefs. We saw um, manta rays and turtles. And, um, and Antoine actually swam with dolphins on the reefs. And this is, um, this is Tobago Cays, which is kind of a network of reefs and small islands. And you can only get there by boat. So just absolutely beautiful. And this is Irene moored in the center of Tobago Cays. Everybody else has got posh plastic yachts and we had a beautiful wooden ship. Um, but um, so while, I, while we were sailing, I, I kept a blog and kind of told a lot of the stories about the people we met and the projects we visited. So if you're interested in seeing more of the specifics of the stories, um, you can check out our website, which is www.newdawntraders.com, or I've got a blog site, which is Lucy and the New Dawn Traders. Um, this is us coming into Martinique. And um, one of the ambitions that I've got for the project is, well, first of all, that it's not just a one-off. I mean, this was a very experimental trip. We were just testing out what we could do and whether we could trade goods and who was interested. But I'd really like to set up a social enterprise that provides opportunities for young people um, to, to go sailing and to, to learn about kind of trade and culture and food. It, it's, being on a ship is um, incredible for like actually learning about what are the things you need and being resourceful and planning because you've got to make sure you've got enough water, you've got to make sure you've got enough food, you've got to pre preserve everything well. So I think it's a, a great place to kind of really practically, you know, experience like what your needs are and plan, which I think is actually a really important part of kind of uh, tackling climate change and tackling waste. Um, this is doing some repairs just before heading home, and this is a pelican. I love pelicans, really beautiful. Um, this is the British Virgin Islands. We, we weren't meant to be going to the British Virgin Islands. We ended up there sort of by accident because the rudder broke. And um, if, if you don't, a, a ship without a rudder is a bit lost at sea, so we had to stop there for five days and make repairs, but it's literally paradise. 
just n never seen anything like it. And um, we found Orlando Bloom on the beach, so it's obviously a favourite with pirates. Um, and, and this is Bermuda, which is famous for its triangle and also for being a tax haven. So that's where people like David Cameron's family stash all their money and don't pay their taxes. Boo. Um, and uh, this is the last sunset that we saw as we were heading out on our final Atlantic crossing home. We were a little bit terrified because Hurricane Beryl, which actually got downgraded to Tropical Storm Beryl while we were there, um, was really close to us and we got the tail end of it. Um, so we had an awful lot of rain and it was very windy and stormy sailing home. And uh, I think I've come to the end of the pictures nearly. It was very cold, and then I got back to really, really cold miserableness. Oh, yeah, the, the boom broke on the way home as well. I was like, oh. Yeah, the whole, the whole, whole way around, we had all sorts of things going on. But, but it was um, an incredible experience. Um, this is, um, actually, this was sent to me by Amy Letts, who's one of the organizers here, and she said, you never um, cross the ocean if you don't first leave the shore. So. Um, I just wanted to end on, like, if you've got a dream and you want to do something positive for the environment, then I say keep visioning it, keep thinking about it. And actually one day, like, I do think that they come around. Certainly for me, I'd been kind of dreaming about going to sea and, you know, doing a project about food and climate change um, that was kind of fun and inspirational. And, and it came up, and so I just wanted to share it all with you. So that's it. Thank you.